Well, the thing I've been really interested in the last few years in my research is thinking about the problem of fascism and Nazism and the way in which in the, in the human sciences, the history of the human sciences, these phenomena came to be understood. And so I started to excavate, really, the history of that endeavour to understand something that seemed to many people so puzzling, which is why, after the First World War, there was this enormous attraction for um, fascist leaders. Of course, there was another set of questions to do with communism, uh, and, and sometimes those questions converged later on in, in the idea of totalitarianism, which brought together thinking about Stalinism and, and fascism. But my research was really focused on, on fascism and Nazism, and particularly the role of psychoanalysis, the, the role that Sigmund Freud's theories and the practice of psychoanalysis came to play uh, during the interwar period, the 20s and the 30s, and then particularly in the Second World War, the way in which models of the mind, Freud's model of the mind, was deployed by the Allies in trying to get a deeper understanding of the attractions of, of fascism. And um, the more famous kind of landmarks of that literature were produced later after the Second World War. Books like Adorno, uh, Adorno's The Authoritarian Personality and some of his studies of fascist propaganda and generally the Frankfurt School work. But what I realized was there was a much kind of bigger hinterland of studies on both sides of the Atlantic that focused really on that set of problems. And it's a literature that mostly isn't read now, that if it's looked at by historians, it's usually just in a footnote to say that it was simplistic or bad psychobiography or psychohistory. But I think what I was interested in doing was historicizing it, sort of showing why it emerged, where it emerged, and where it led. Uh, and that's really what I, I did in that, uh, that project, particularly looking at, there were two different stories in a way I, I got very absorbed in. One was the story of what happened in Britain uh, when Rudolf Hess, who was the deputy Führer of the Nazi party, became a prisoner of state after this bizarre flight when, when Hess came to, to, to Scotland on a plane with a kind of one-man peace mission. And then he became a, a prisoner and he became the, the, the patient of various army doctors because of Hess's symptoms. They started to study him and to get interested in his psychopathology. And that led to a series of studies and investigations both in Britain and then at the Nuremberg trial of Hess as an individual and his psychopathology. And on the other side of the Atlantic, at the same time, the American Secret Services commissioned uh, some analysts, to, psychoanalysts, to study Hitler. And these were produced as intelligence reports in, in Washington. And I was trying to compare and contrast these endeavours and in a way to situate them in a bigger thing, which was, uh, came from the interwar period, which was not about individuals, but about the so-called masses. And the most, perhaps the most famous landmark of that literature would be Wilhelm Reich's book, The Mass Psychology of Fascism, which was in, in 1933. And um, this project you're describing, uh, it ended up being a book, it's called In Pursuit of the Nazi Mind, did I say that correctly? The, the Pursuit of the yeah. Nazi Mind, yes. So I thought of In Pursuit, uh, <laughs> but I changed it because actually I, it's not me In Pursuit. It's really a book, although I'm a psychoanalyst and a historian, I thought yeah. of this book primarily as a history of the endeavour that was made to pursue this okay. uh, and yeah. to sort of in a way give the context and to show the diversity of what was done. Yep. Okay, yeah, I, I did read it. I mm -hmm. couldn't remember mm -hmm. correctly. Um, uh, so... Um, is the Nazi mind our mind? Uh, all kinds of conclusions have been drawn over the years, mostly by psychoanalysts, about uh, the darker layers in mm -hmm. ourselves. How do you see that? Well, I think, first of all, I'm sceptical about the idea that there is such a thing as the Nazi mind, because clearly there would be a plurality of states of mind that led to, uh, that attracted people towards fascism. So I think the Nazi mind in a way needs to be in quotations, but it was a concept that became quite um, elaborated in the uh, earlier parts of the century, that there was something essential about the mind and about fascism that came together. And I think the language of psychoanalysis did resonate very much in that period in trying to understand 
I mean, of course, there was a diversity of reasons why people were drawn to Mussolini, Hitler, and, and other fascist um, leaders. But uh, there was some sort of sense that the, 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 the terrain that Freud and his followers, like Melanie Klein, were investigating uh, that was relevant to thinking about the, the so-called Nazi mind. And people were, I think, very puzzled it, during the, you know, the period of the rise of fascism, really to understand this phenomenon of what was it uh, that seemed in a way so counterintuitive why people would go for this, uh, this political ideology that was so extreme, so phobic, so paranoid in its structures. And there was gradually a recognition that standard forms of political theory to explain fascism didn't seem to quite do it, didn't seem quite adequate, uh, that there was something else going on, a kind of enjoyment of of uh, fascism that you see, obviously, most uh, in, in dramatic ways at things like the Nuremberg rallies in the 30s, but a kind of identification and excitement and euphoria in, in those sorts of festivals and spectacles of fascism that demanded some kind of explanation and why it was that people were drawn to the to this kind of extremist philosophy. And it was in that kind of space of um, puzzlement about what was going on between the leader and the led, both in the minds of the, of the elite and the entourage around Hitler and in Hitler himself, and then in the rapport between Hitler and the, and the, the larger electorate that led to a new kind of space for exploration in the human sciences. I think both psychoanalysis was brought to bear and also cultural anthropology, uh, other forms of knowledge, sociology, history, and there was an attempt to, in a way, a multidisciplinary attempt to bring all of these uh, these forms of knowledge together to try to understand what was going on, and above all, to learn lessons about how you could avoid a relapse into the new forms of fascism after 1945. So, in a way, my research project was both looking at the the lead up to the war and the war, and then at the aftermath of the war. And the, the attempts that were made um, in America, in Britain, in Paris, at UNESCO, for example, which was set up uh, as one of the kind of uh, outcrops of the war through the UN and then UNESCO, but where they, they tried to bring people in who would think about this in, uh, with a concern of an anxiety, how did you avoid a return to new forms of fascism? And I thought those endeavors were worth recovering and exploring again, because they also seem very relevant to us. It's not just a history that's dead or past, it's a history that in a way is relevant to contemporary thinking. Um, uh, you have described in your project uh, uh, really the 20th century um, when psychoanalysis was uh, very important for all the reasons you've just mm. given. What will, it will its relevance be in the 21st century? Well, of course, one of the things that's very notable about psychoanalysis is it's very much under attack. It's, um, there are other forms, both of therapy, that compete with it, and many people are very sceptical about it. Now, in a way, that's been true throughout the history of psychoanalysis. There's always been a history of controversy surrounding its efficacy as a clinical procedure and its theory of the mind and its method of investigation. So I think that's just part of the history of psychoanalysis. But I think that it does continue to have relevance as a kind of resource we have, a problematic resource, but nonetheless a very rich resource, both for thinking about mental processes, and it it's, provides a very rich vocabulary for thinking about the mind. I think in a way it's the most sophisticated account we have of the inner world, you know, um, but it also does have relevance to thinking about social, cultural, political questions, although one needs a big caveat with that, which is that it can't replace other forms of knowledge. And perhaps where psychoanalysis was at its worst as a kind of applied discipline was when it, at times in the 20th century, did seek to replace or to sort of provide a key, a kind of explanatory key to everything, as though it could replace sociology or anthropology or economics or history. And I think it can't do that. Um, and that one needs to be cautious because minds are not the same as groups and groups aren't the same as states. All of these levels of, ex you know, of, of uh, uh, existence require different kinds of investigation. But I think nonetheless that psychoanalysis has something of relevance to offer because in a way there's a role of fantasy that is not just in the mind of individual people but that also resonates in the life of groups 
and also in, in culture and ideology, that there can be powerful fantasies mobilised that psychoanalysis has been quite good at exploring and contributing to our understanding of.